For anyone at FGC uh, planning for next year, I have some suggestions for the Bible half hour for next year. I want to maybe do some radical changes, perhaps. Like one, have it be a Bible full hour. Wait, okay. And wait, wait, just make sure you're with me. Change the time so that people don't have to get up quite so early. Okay, now this is the most radical of all. Get a giant hot tub. <laughs> Waterproof Bibles. And we'll call it the Bible bath hour. I feel grateful that there are different types of men and women in the world. That not all men and women are gendered the same way. I love that. That there's a diversity of how we express ourselves in our gender. I mean, we all have like sex that we're born with. We're assigned a sex at birth. Birth certificates has an M or an F. Now, there are people in the world that it's not so clear looking at a baby if you have a boy or a girl. There are over 40 different intersex conditions where someone may have ambiguous genitalia, they may have a, an extra chromosome. So, so, determining someone's sex actually isn't always as easy as we think. And then there's our gender, which can change from country to country, town to town, room to room. Like wearing this shirt at gathering here is it not, it's not necessarily a, a gender transgressive thing in a gathering where lots of men wear skirts and sarongs. But when I recently wore it in Lebanon, Tennessee and went to the barber shop, the barber, I had my hat on, the barber said, um, yes ma'am, what would you like? <laughs> and I hadn't shaved that day. Uh, and, and that's the thing. There's all sorts of clues of gender that people get. Facial hair doesn't always tell what gender we may be. Uh, body structure doesn't always tell. What I love is in the Bible there are examples of people who are gendered differently. There's the delicious story in the book of Judges chapter 4 of Deborah. I mentioned her yesterday. A poet, a prophet, a judge, a warrior, not your typical Jewish mother. In a book which is very violent, there are all of these political, spiritual, military leaders, all male, one after another. And then all of a sudden, there's Deborah. No real explanation of how she became Deborah, but she is the political, military, spiritual leader of the nation. She is the father and the mother of the country. And such a strong, powerful presence that when they had to go to war to defend themselves against their enemies that were attacking them, the general said, I will only go to war, Deborah, if you agree to come along with us. And what's lovely about this story of Deborah, there's another woman in the story named Yael. And Yael is painted in the text as this willowy housewife of a woman who is a hostess. I mean, she's presented as a hostess. She's, she's like the Martha Stewart of the Bible. And, and what's lovely is you have these two women side by side who are both female identified, but they're gendered differently. Not that a woman can't be a military and political leader. It's just up until that time, we didn't see that much in the text at all. And in today's culture, we don't see it that much. But the way they were perceived by others around them, the way they carry themselves, their roles, their presentation, they were gendered differently. If I were to create an artificial line here uh, across the front, and I, and I had us all stand on the line somewhere as a, as a spectrum. And I said, that side is extreme male, that side is extreme female. How, whatever that means to you, or however the world sees you, put yourself somewhere on this line. 
chances are we would not have two large clumps of people on either ends. We would not have a binary. We would have a spectrum. And this is true for straight, for gay, for bi, for trans. We all gender differently. And it's a moving target. It changes as we move from room to room and put on different clothes. Weekend clothes, we may look more male than during the, the week. It all changes. There's another wonderful story of, of two people side by side who are gendered differently. They're two males, two brothers who happen to be twins. So you think, oh, they're twins. They're going to be very much alike. These are not identical twins. It's the story of Esau and his twin brother Jacob. It's a Hebrew scripture story. There was Abraham, and then there was Isaac and Rebekah, and then Rebekah had these twins, Esau and Jacob. And let me just give you a little reading about what these two boys were like, their personalities. In Genesis 19, verse 27, 27 it says, the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet, sensitive man staying amongst the tents. Isaac, their father, had a taste for wild game, and he loved the more gender-normative Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. This sense that Jacob like to dwell amongst the tents, is coded with gender, and not gender that we're imposing from modern times onto ancient times. It's encoded in the text. Women dwelt amongst the tents. And Esau and Jacob were different physically in many ways. For one, Esau was darker than Jacob from the moment they were born. Uh, Esau was very red. His other name is Edom, which is red. He also was most likely darker than Jacob most of their life because he was an outdoorsman. He was out in the sun. And like the women in these cultures who stayed amongst the tents, they were usually lighter skinned than the men. They may all have been darker skinned because we're talking about people who are in, in Africa and what we call the Middle East today. But the women were typically lighter because they were not exposed to the sun as much. Uh, I know we have people who know the Bible here. And if we were to uh, form a casting agency and we were going to do a film about Esau and Jacob, in casting Esau, what am I going to look for? What kind of body type do we want for Esau? What do you know about Esau? He was a hairy man. Now, those of you who don't know this story, he wasn't just a hairy man. He was a hairy man. He was so hairy that at one point Esau um, was, was out hunting and his brother Jacob, who is not a hairy man, he was a smooth-skinned man. Jacob um, was convinced by their mother to go and trick their blind father that, uh, that Jacob was really Esau and was going to bring some food so that they can, he can get a blessing. And Jacob said, but, but how can I trick my father? Um, my brother is a hairy man. My father, as soon as he, he holds me, touches me, he'll know I'm smooth Jacob. The mother says, perfect, hold on. She gets sheepskin, ties it to his arms and his chest, says, now go. You are in Esau drag. Go. <laughs> and so he goes, and he's like, father, <clears throat> father, I have the soup for you. He's like, hmm, you don't sound like my son Esau. Come over here. Goes over and he's like, yep, that's my boy. Big old hairy guy. <laughs> so these two men, twins, one hairy, outdoor, skilled outdoors, and one sensitive, quiet, smooth skin, indoors with the women. And like we did yesterday, I want us to embody a character. And as an actor, I was trained as an actor in what's called the Stanislavski method, where it's not just putting on a face like that actor, externally being that actor, but trying to connect with the inner life of a character. And a lot of it is using our imagination. And Esau gets a, a bad rap often, this Esau character, but I feel a lot of empathy for him. 
He reminds me a lot of students I worked with when I was a ninth grade teacher, and I worked with mostly boys who were athletes who were unbelievably skillful out in the field, but struggled so hard in the classroom to keep up. Very smart in some places in the world, but feeling so cumbersome in the classroom. And I think of Esau that way, uh, someone who's easily tricked. And he does get tricked in big ways. Someone who may not be very good at business, but really good at what he does. A hairy man. Then he may not be a big hairy man. He may be a small hairy man. Wiry hairy man. I don't know. So when I count to three, I want you to stand up as Esau and explore who your Esau would be as you stand up. Like, are you going to be a big, hulking guy, or are you going to be a slight, kind of muscular guy? And see what you can connect with in the inner life of Esau, and what inner pain and fears he might have. When I count to three, please stand as Esau. One, two, three. Let your shoulders move in a way that Esau's shoulders might move, and your feet may spread apart wider than you normally do, or closer together. And feel where the center of gravity might be for this very earthbound character. <coughs> Someone who's out in the wild a lot. And as Esau, take a hunting pose. And whatever you do, multiply it now by 10. Make it bigger. <coughs> and stand up straight. Shake it out. And you can go back to being yourself. Now, Jacob and Esau had conflicts because Jacob uh, tricked his brother out of the blessing and the birthright. There was one blessing, there was one birthright, and although uh, Esau was entitled to it because he was the elder son, Jacob tricked him out of it. And so they were estranged from each other for a long time, and they eventually come back together, and, and Jacob makes peace with his brother because he's afraid that his brother might beat the snot out of him. Uh, and so there's this a huge passage in Genesis where he's meeting his brothers, but he's putting, you know, giving all these gifts ahead of time, camels and sheep and all this stuff to sort of soften the blow when they finally meet. But Jacob goes off and has uh, a family. Uh, as far as we know, he's, he's decidedly heterosexual, Jacob. He has four wives and has many children. So from what we can tell in the text, he is a fully functioning, practicing heterosexual. And he has many sons, he has some daughters too, and he has many sons, including a son named Joseph. Joseph. So this is Joseph's father. Uh, you know, the, the, and the 12 tribes of Israel, many of them come from Isaac. I mean, from, yes, from um, Jacob directly. So it's Isaac and Jacob. Jacob get, changes his name at one point to Israel. And this Joseph character is such a marvelous character who appears in Christian stories, in, in Jewish stories, in Muslim stories, a celebrated character through history. There's lots have been written about this beautiful Joseph, and that's the word that's used in the Bible to describe him. He is beautiful, not an adjective we often hear about men. And I want to tell you the story of Joseph in a different way. I want to tell you the story of Joseph from the perspective of Esau. If Esau told this story, what does this story look like? And in that telling, I'm going to reveal to you some scholarship that I have discovered that I'll explain once the scene is over. Yeah, I'm Esau. You probably know my brother Jacob, although he changed his name to Israel. No, Jacob and me, I'm, we're twins, although you'd never know it by looking at us. I mean, I'm a real man. I'm big, I'm hairy, always outdoors doing real men's work. Well, my brother, he's as smooth as a woman, very sensitive growing up, liked to dwelt amongst the tents with the women. They're cooking, they're gossiping, they're scheming. He was a real girly boy. And since I was normal, our father, Isaac, he favored me. 
Now, the thing about my brother, although he was a girly boy, he liked the women, don't get me wrong. He had four wives, and from those women, he had a slew of children, sons and daughters, strong, strapping young men, all of the sons, except for one of his youngest, Joseph. Joseph, listen, this kid was trouble from the day he was born. Always crying, clinging to his mother, never wanting to go out with the boys, doing real men's work. And then when he got older, he would have these dreams, these crazy dreams he told us about. Listen, boys are not supposed to dream. One day I pulled my brother aside. I said, listen, you got to toughen up that kid. It's a rough world. They're going to ride right over him. But does he listen to me? No. He gives him everything he wants, including that robe. Now listen, you wouldn't catch me dead in a robe like that. For one, too expensive for my taste, a royal garment, the kind of garment a king would give to his virgin daughter. Yeah, it was a princess dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother, Jacob, gave his son, Joseph, a princess dress. And that kid put that dress on and flitted about the compound like he was some kind of butterfly. And I thought, this is not going to end well. <laughs> sure enough, one day when, jo when the boys were out in the field doing real men's work, Jacob sent Joseph to go check on them. And that girly boy, no sense in his head, puts on the stupid dress, goes traipsing across the countryside, makes fools of all of us. Well, his brothers, they saw him from a distance. <laughs> Who can miss him in that getup? And they said, enough of this dreamer. And they rushed him. They threw him to the ground. They beat him black and blue, trying to beat some sense into him. And then they ripped off the stupid dress, tore it to pieces, defiled it in blood. They came back with a bloody garment and a story about how their brother was attacked by a wild beast. And that's all that remained. But later they pulled me aside, they told me what really happened, how they sold their brother as a slave to some traders going off to Egypt. And I thought, you know what? It's probably all for the best. I mean, listen, I'm a shepherd, I know. You got a weak lamb, you take it out. And besides, he might do okay for himself there in Egypt land where they go in for that whole girly boy thing. <laughs> Years went by and I confess I didn't give him much of a thought. Who's got time to mourn? But then we had that drought and famine. I'd been through it time and time again, but this time it was different. It was like the earth was cursed against us. You couldn't scratch life out of the ground. It got so bad, we finally sent the boys to Egypt to get grain. Not to beg, mind you. We beg from no one. And they were brought before some high official in Pharaoh's court. And at first, they couldn't tell what it was. A man or a woman with a headdress, the makeup, the flowing robes. Those Egyptians. <laughs> Turns out, it was their very own brother, Joseph. Somehow that girly boy worked his way up through the ranks to become second in command of the whole kingdom. But they didn't recognize him under all that gunk. Well, this was Joseph's chance to get back at his brothers, to get revenge. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You don't let anyone ride over you. But does he? Not that girly boy. He goes off weeping like a woman. And then he comes back and tries to teach his brothers some lesson. And then he forgives them and he, he reconciles with them. And he gives them food. He gives them shelter. He, he treats them like he's their mother or their sister or something. Not like any man I've ever seen. And in so doing, that girly boy, my nephew, Joseph. He saved us all. So, I can't read the story of Joseph in Genesis without weeping. There's always some point when I read the story I start to cry. Even in the Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat musical, I'll find myself. <laughs> it's a very moving story in so many ways. The way Joseph treats his brothers is just extraordinary. I mean, those of us who do, who, 
who love piecework, who this is our heart. Do we see this piecework that happens? And it is interesting when we look at it with gender lenses for a moment, and we see that Jacob was gendered differently from Esau, has all these sons, and there's this one son that is different from the others, very verbal linguistic, very engaged with the world in this creative way with, with dreams. And at one point, Jacob gives Joseph a garment that creates so much trouble. Now, there were issues with Joseph. There were fears about inheritance rights. There was jealousy. And Joseph was so, sort of filled with him, full of himself at times. But there was also something about this garment that was the last straw. Now, when you look in most study Bibles, uh, it will tell you that the garment itself, the Hebrew word, um, scholars are not quite sure what this garment is. The note often is the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear, which isn't so strange. We don't know everything about Hebrew. It's an ancient language uh, with a limited vocabulary, and we don't know everything. So if you're going to do serious biblical scholarship, you have to say, okay, well, what is the word? And does it appear anywhere else in the text to give us some understanding? The word is actually a phrase. It's ketonet pasim. So Jacob gave Joseph a ketonet pasim. And so you say, okay, well, does this appear anywhere else in the text, in the book of Genesis? And no, it does not. It only appears in regards to Joseph, the garment that his father gave him, that he put on, that his father, that when his brothers, when they attacked him, they tore that to shreds and defiled it in blood. I say, okay, well, what about anywhere else in the Bible? Does it appear in the, anywhere else in Hebrew? Only one other story in all of the Hebrew scriptures in 2 Samuel. It's a story of King David. It's actually a story of King David's daughter, who's named Tamar, like our character from yesterday. It's a very tragic story because it's a story of sexual violence and rape uh, and a story of a family who doesn't deal well with that at all and it just makes it worse. In the story, Tamar is raped by her half-brother. And, uh, and she's tricked and she's raped by her half-brother. And in the story, her garment gets torn. And in the text, it tells us what the princess Tamar, Tamar is wearing. Like Joseph, she too is wearing a ketonet pasim. And then it goes on to define it for us in the text, the garment worn by the virgin daughters of the king a princess dress. Now I could just imagine a scholar, probably a male scholar, straight, gender normative, traditional scholar, looking at the Genesis account, looking at 2 Samuel and concluding the exact meaning of the Hebrew word is unclear. <laughs> we have no idea. No, it could mean anything. Now, if you have any intellectual integrity, you have to admit that one possible interpretation is that Jacob gave his son a female garment. It doesn't have to be the only interpretation. It doesn't have to be the interpretation that you even agree with. But it has to be on the table because it's in the text. And if we go with that interpretation for a moment, suddenly the story takes on a different light. When the brothers see Joseph in public with that dress, they get irrationally violent and do violence against Joseph and what he's wearing. They destroy it. And if it was such a fine garment that they all were envious over, they would have found a way to ditch their brother and somebody had gone home wearing that garment. No, they wanted nothing to do with it. And the violence I see in the text reminds me of violence I hear about today against gender non-conforming people, against transgender people, against trans women, particularly transgender women of color. November 20th is a very important day of the year in the LGBTQ community. It is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. It's the day that we say the names of all the people we know of who were murdered that year because they were gender nonconforming. And often it's a horrendously large list and the violence is extreme. 
I'm grateful we have other days that we can celebrate the, the wonderful accomplishments and the gifts that transgender people bring to the community. But this one day, we say these names. And I invite you, if you've never been to the Transgender Day of Remembrance, please go. It will mean a lot to people that you show up. And so Joseph is attacked and then sent off to Egypt as a slave, goes to Africa. And there he is favored by everyone. He is beautiful. There's something delightful about him. And even though he gets in trouble in his household, he is uh, working for an official in Pharaoh's court by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife tries to have sex with him, is interested in him, uh, and he gets in trouble and goes to jail. And even in the all-male prison population, his gifts, he rises to the top with his dream analysis and this wonderful stuff he does. He becomes second in command of the whole kingdom. And the brothers come. And he weeps and he weeps. And he does something extraordinary. Up until that point, every time there had been a conflict, the response had been violence, revenge. And suddenly, Joseph does something that no man did up until that point in the text. He transcended gender. And he became the matriarch of the family. He brought them all together. And I am personally very grateful to be in a religious society of friends. That there are men who are gentle and tender. Men like John Humphreys from my home meeting in Hartford, who is a straight man with family and a tender man with a tender heart. And that there's room in the religious society of friends for all kinds of men. Some sissy boys grow up to be women. Some grow up to be straight men with kind, tender hearts. Some tomboys grow up to become men. Some grow up to be women, take charge, or in, have much to offer. And in our society of friends, we have this lovely, lovely way that we can be real and authentic with each other. And that is perhaps one of the greatest gifts that we can give to each other.